My name is Kenny Hill, and I'm running to be the 61st mayor of Atlanta. I really learned a lot about what people are experiencing and what they hope to see in our city from our conversation today. CCI is doing a great job of being that place, that watering hole for people to come and get information and then go back to their communities. Please be sure to vote on November 2nd. I know politics can be uh, a burden, but every voice counts. Your voice matters. Please vote on November 2nd. Please check me out on my website, electkennyhill.com. Vote ATL. For me, it's, um, I think it's a progression. Uh, my career with the Home Depot was 30 years. I spent 12 of those years in, uh, at the Cascade store. So an uh, area where you have some of the high income, medium and low income individuals uh, that were my customers, my employees uh, and my community members. And as the leader in that location, it was my responsibility to serve the community, to train my team to serve our customers. Uh, and I just didn't take that as a job. It became a passion. It became, uh, it, was, it was my mission uh, to help uplift the people who work for me so that we could provide a level of service to our customers and to our community. And uh, at, for 30 years of working with the Home Depot, it was you know, time for me to transition uh, in 2016, and my wife and I, we started a nonprofit in 2014 okay. in the area that, that I have been working, and that's called the Launchpad Foundation. And we took that uh, nonprofit to provide housing for homeless single moms. Uh, my mom was a single parent, seven of us, I was the eldest. Seven. Seven kids. That experience growing up, you talk about inequality, just, I remember. I was exposed through, through people and processes in life with inequality in several different ways. Uh, crime uh, was a part of my everyday existence where we grew up in California. Yeah. Uh, my mom had very strict guidelines for me, uh, but it was all around me. Yeah. Uh, and I saw where it took a lot of my friends. I came to a point where I actually committed crime. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it was to help my family. I'm 15 years old, I'm a sophomore in high school. In the state of California, you can't get a job until you're 16. But we were running out of food every week. There was a McDonald's uh, in the neighborhood, and I said, I went to apply, I got the application, and it said, you must be 16 years old. And I'm like, you know what? I gotta do something. So I went to school the next day, went to the library, and I forged my birth certificate to say I was one year older, and went back and I got a job so I could help feed our family. So I can see how someone would do. Now, my mom had really strong guidelines around, and I, mean, I never told her that. She just thought I got a job. Well, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. But all that food we had, you know, that was. Yeah, yeah. They, but yeah. so I can relate to people who do wrong things if you don't have the basics, if you right. don't have necessities. So, and I'm sorry I'm being long-winded, but in my role at, at Cascade, that was the driving force for me to help people have the opportunities that, was afford, that were afforded to me. Yeah. Home Depot was great for me. I had this great leadership, Frank Blake, Carol Tomei. Yeah. I learned how you can put people before profits and still knock it out of the park. Sure, yeah. And, and that just went with me. So we started our nonprofit, taking homeless single moms out of shelters. Yeah. Uh, our house was one of the shelters we were. Yeah. Uh, bring them into our properties that me and my wife had purchased. And we begin to wrap around services for them to help them see their life could be different, their kids' lives could be different, and working with them, not three months, not six months, and say, okay, you gotta go. We took a full year minimum yep. to make sure that they had what they needed. So when you look at the community uh, that I was working in, you look at the people I was dealing with, it's a natural progression for me to say, I wanna help at a higher level. Yep. I wanna help our city, those people who have not had the opportunities, I see where crime starts. On the one hand, you talk about the people who are here, born here, who don't have access to the jobs. And I think that's where the mayor, and, uh, the mayor of Atlanta and the superintendent of Atlanta Public Schools have to be lockstep because the school system should be providing the workforce of tomorrow. Yeah. But when we have the mayor and the school superintendent on totally different lanes doing their own things, that, that's... Obviously so not. what are you suggesting, that the two entities become one? Or no, no, no. Yeah. They, they, but we need to be communicating. We need to be sharing. Here's, here's what works for the workforce and the companies that we're drawing to Atlanta. Do you think that the mayor and the, and the superintendent are not talking right now? 
Well, I'm looking historically in the last 12 years, it's not been a not have not been not have been a cohesive yeah. uh, approach to let's make sure that we get the technical school skills to the students who are coming out to give them opportunities for these companies that are coming here. We we haven't seen that. And why do you think that is? I think it's been p politics. Yeah, uh, yeah, just uh, people at two different camps feeling that you know. I, this is my territory, and that's your territory. You stay over there, and I'll stay over here. Yeah. But people's futures are on the line, which, yeah. and we can't afford that. Yeah. So what would you do to bridge that gap between, um, you know, the communications channels of the Atlanta public school system and yeah. the I, city? I would have a direct conversation with the superintendent yeah. about her vision for preparing students for the workforce yeah. and how Atlanta as a city... Yeah, sorry, train go by. It's all part of the yeah. effect, you know? We're about to talk about, that's the signal we need to start talking about transportation. Something else, transportation. Uh, so it's the transportation mafia around here. It's crazy, so don't no, mind them. No uh, problem. But yeah, so the bridging the gap between yes. uh, APS and, and the city. Yes, because the, uh, the conversation that needs to be held is how can I as a mayor help you prepare students for the jobs that I'm bringing companies here? Right. Not you know you do what you do and I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah. But how so? How can I circle uh, companies around your schools? How can I circle uh, civic organizations around your schools? Yeah. Mentorship. Those those are there's tremendous untapped opportunities from the office of the mayor that are available yeah. to bring to light. Here's opportunities for students. And when students are motivated by their passions, yeah. The dropout rates go away. Yeah. Yeah. And so that directly helps the superintendent with her focus and her vision. Right. So, but when we don't have that conversation and that desire, uh, we, we're leaving all of that on the table, and, yeah. and it's costing people their a future. It's costing, yeah. and it's costing a lot of the workforce development issues that we're having. Yeah. With, with people, we got jobs that we don't have people for. When we talk about tent clearing, I think that's reactionary. I think we need to first get to the bottom of where are these people? Because there are some people who will not do housing if you offer it to them. I, I know from doing how they, I don't, either they don't trust the organization, they don't, unless it's freezing cold outside, they will not go into a center of hope or they won't go into Gateway Center. Yeah. So we, we have to first do the work of addressing why are you here in a tent? Is there a space for you? Right. And, and because it's illegal to be, especially on the side of the freeway under a bridge, that's not really safe. So, but before we just do clearing, we need to have the conversations and make sure there are resources available. And then we also need to make sure that we've honored our requirement of having homeless centers throughout the city, which has been promised one in each district. We're gonna make sure that, you know, wherever you are, there is some, and it hasn't happened. And I learned something about this. So in my, my nonprofit, I own a, a multifamily uh, uh, property. And in that, I have people who are in my program who just got out of uh, a shelter and in my program. There are people who are on Section 8 vouchers, and there are people who are paying market rate. And because of the way we run the program, the people don't know who's who. Yeah. They don't know who has just been accepted from a shelter or who's receiving a Section 8 voucher or who's paying full market rate. Yeah. Uh, so there's a way of partnering with nonprofits to make it work to where it's not a community eyesore. Because right. nobody wants that. I don't want that for my building. I don't want that. So we, there's a way to do it. Before we talk about clearing tents and, and removing people, we have have to done the hard work of there's a place for this person to go. We've had some people say they want to do it, not do it. What's your stance? So yes, first of all, yes or no, what would be your vote today if, uh, if, if, if that was you? And then tell me what, then defend it. So my vote would be, and, and you have to, let me back up. If it was a part of an agreement, and that was written, uh, and a written agreement that this, in, in that community's plan, development plan, we don't back out on that. Kelly, Kenny Hill, I'm just starting to like you, so I want to go back and give you a <laughs> chance to re-answer that question, because that you're, you're a political outsider and you're starting to talk yeah. like a political insider. No, no. Uh, so there is a proposal on the table. Yes. 
you presumably as a candidate for mayor yes. have read this proposal, know what's in it, know what's not in it. You've read the legislation that is there. Yes. I'm making that presumption. Um, there is a vote on the table. Right. You can either vote yes, no, or you can abstain at, like you know some folks who never show up. Uh, <laughs> which way would you vote? So I would say no. No, do not build. Do not build it there. Okay. And the reason is we talked about organizations, NPUs having a say. Yeah. So what I would have liked to have seen is the conversation happen sooner instead of it being brought up where we're planning to do this and here's a vote. Yeah. We need to start talking to that community ahead of time. This is what we like to do. We know you need green space because that was what it was supposed to be. Is there a way that both can coexist? Is, is that a possibility? Is there a way this can be fit and into it? Or do we need the whole thing for Cop City? So it's unfortunate that from a, the city standpoint, we don't do the conversations on the front end. Yeah. We let people find out, oh, this is what's being proposed, and now they're reactionary. And so if you hear something, oh, they're, they're taking our green space, now you're, you're on the defensive. But if I come to you and say, Rohit, I'm thinking about doing a training center, uh, and I think we can fit it along with develop green space for the community, I'd like for you to come and let's talk about it and let's look at it. It's just, it just feels, I think this is, I think you're hitting on where people get frustrated. They're like, it's always, number one, when you were talking about, like, if we had a pre preconceived agreement, then, you know, we got to, Part of it is we break our agreements to community all the damn that, time. And that's, so that's, I don't, I mean, that's, so I don't really, yeah, whatever. The, the, the second uh, thing is, okay, fine. Let's say that there is an opportunity, but why, why is it that we have to have a compromise of that? We know that, that black, and, uh, black communities in Atlanta have less green space mm -hmm. than anywhere else. And that is a climate issue. And I've learned this mm -hmm. from Kiyomi directly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Kiyo, you know, the, what, what I've learned from her work and, and her advocacy is that you know, when you, folks don't want to be outside because they can't be outside, uh, there, there is not enough green space. There's not enough canopy space. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're, we have a lot of trees. And, and, and people think about climate issues as just like yeah. trees and plants. Um, but it's a public health issue. It, it has is. that. So we, sh it was a public health. Why does everything in the city always have to come back to policing? Uh, and <laughs> it's like even our green space issue has to now be affected by policing. I'm just, yeah. I don't get it. Well, it, it, it shouldn't. But I, I think when I talked about the NPUs being empowered, yeah, that's another thing is that that you have to, for your city, to have the respect of the people, sure, they have, their voices have to be heard. Of course, and that has to be something you're willing to say. Okay, now we got to go and find another alternative. And the council member who represents that district is saying, "My people are not really for this." So, Singing other it. than making people aware of voting, what are the deadlines? Uh, providing information on access to your polls. Um, it's it's unfortunate that. The yeah, it's it's the county and the state that are the, the two big fish in this yeah. bowl. Yeah. Um, but we, we we have to have fair access to voting for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and the, you know the city, uh, you know, make resources available maybe to have uh, the people who need a ride to the polls. Yeah. Let's make the city can do that. Yeah, I agree that the, the, the county should be, just like everywhere else, the county should be in charge of voting. Yeah. yeah. The, the elections, I mean. Yeah. Um, but you can't stop the legislation that's already been put forward. I, I won't be able to reel that back. Yeah. Uh, but having a dialogue with him to things we can agree on, let's agree and let's work, because he's done some good things. So I think it, it comes from where your heart is, for me. Uh, I'll use one example. So if we're building the belt line. If we're going to do rail, which we need rail, it probably needs its own dedicated lane, so it's not. But we're not going to start on one side and then we'll work our way and we'll get to the we'll get to the west side. If yeah. the money doesn't run out, if whatever, whatever. Yeah. No. So we'll start. We're going to work. We're starting both sides and we'll work and meet in the middle. Okay. Because equity means that you're willing to stand behind what equity stands for and give everybody involved the same opportunity to benefit from. With, but in terms of transportation, 
I'm mm -hmm. saying equity means you're getting, you can't repay somebody for transportation they didn't have, but you can make sure they're getting it as a first right versus so that would be, so your prioritization would be on the areas that have not had uh, yes the people the people who have the hardest time getting to work and then you get there and you make the lowest wage you you yeah. you take Lauren to get to work and get home but then you get there and you get the lowest wage that's so what's the the transportation change or, or yeah what so we, we you start in those areas investing just as much as you are anywhere else yeah. So the engineers can come up with where it makes sense and all yeah. this, but you know what? No, we're not just going to start at the CDC. Sure. It's going to start, we're going to start in both places and we'll meet in the middle. So I'm doing a nonprofit through the, my rental property as well as doing market rate and Atlanta housing. Yeah. Uh, so finding like where people's experiences and each of those is real interesting yeah. to see what that looks like. So as mayor, you have control basically over what Atlanta housing does yeah but you don't you don't have control over setting market rates across the city you can't just wave a wand and say sure. we're gonna have rent control um, so I think we need to empower uh, Atlanta Housing Authority to make sure that we're looking at what is the data that really supports where affordability is for housing we control okay we need to build more because the city needs to build more we well we, need, we have parcels that we can use okay. for developers to build. Okay. And that needs to be definitely stated for affordable housing. Okay. We hadn't had single family affordable housing built by Atlanta Housing Authority in over 11 years. Yeah. Some, some multifamily, but no single family okay. at all in 11 years. Okay. And that's crazy. So first we, before we can point our fingers to anybody else, we have to be doing what we can do. Yeah. Uh, and I think that will take some of the pressure off, but we also have to leverage people being able to earn more yeah. because, you know, housing and transportation, yeah. there's your budget yeah. for most people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so by helping people get into those jobs that pay and then building affordable housing with partners that is affordable housing that people can use in this transit oriented. So again, you're not the poorest people having the hardest time to get to work. Yeah. That type of focus does what you can't do by waving a wand and setting, you know, like, New York or San Francisco. The conversation has to happen. That's the first part. Um, being in corporate, I had to deal with people of all spectrums. Yeah. But the thing is, is that if we limit it to talking about people and not addressing the system, then you're, all, you're only going to get so far. You have to address the system. Sure. You have to say, you know what, this is not right. If, 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 if there's in unequal or in, in equities and opportunities, yeah. that's a problem, and that problem is affecting people who are black, black and brown. Right. And how do you address that? Now, now we need to have the conversation. So first of all, you have to respect me enough, I have to respect you enough to say, we see a problem, let's talk about it. Or else we're talking at each other, mm -hmm. and that's not getting us anywhere because at the end of the day, you're going to walk away still on the premise you arrived before we started. Sure. And I'm gonna, so we have to have enough respect for each other to appreciate each other's perspective yep. and be willing to open up and engage. Yep. And that's where people, you know, people want to shrink back and not, don't want to open up and engage. So let me, let me explain to you what it meant for me to not to have equal opportunities yep. to be turned down. Even when I was at Home Depot, I didn't get every promotion I went up for. Right. I trained people who were promoted over me yeah. And they didn't look like me. Yeah. And I had to deal with that. So there was there there's a level of mutual respect we have to come to to be able to get transparent. Yeah. And say this system's not working and here's why. And yeah. if you reval if you value and respect my opinion, then you allow me to show you why this is not working. Yeah. And how we need to change it. Yeah. But if you're just standing on the principle of well, everything's fair, and we're going to give everybody a fair shot, and that's the rule, we're never going to make progress. Sure. So I think bringing partnerships to bear is, is key. We have, the city of Atlanta has the ability to create partnerships that are amazing. Home Depot stepped up in ways, since I've left in 2016, they stepped up in ways that I, I was surprised to see their level, presently, pleasantly surprised. But there, there are third-party investments available to get to these needed things for our city. So as mayor, 
reaching out to all these corporate headquarters that are represented in our, in our community saying, let's work together to solve the issues that cause crime. And I share my story. I, yeah. I know where it starts. Yeah. So yeah, the general fund can only hold so much. Yeah. But let's let's leverage and 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 instead of worrying about you know money for my campaign, hey, let's go take care of what our city needs. Yeah. That's my focus on how we're going to bring this, the resources. Is we got to let we do what we can from the from the general fund, but that's not the solution. Yeah, we can't have all the money going after the big trying to get the big fish landed uh, without those big fish been contributing to these issues. So whether we, uh, whether that looks like Invest Atlanta changing or a part of the deal that we're doing with developers is, yes, you're contributing to these resources being made available to these at-risk populations. A lot of times it's um, the lack of exposure, that people understand the power of exposure. I was fortunate, somebody exposed me to here's how you get ahead. You Who know? exposed so, you? So I, so I have one uncle, my mom's brother, who uh, went to college, uh, and then he went to the military as an officer. Uh, and he would send letters back then, you got letters in the mail. He was just like a, it was like he was like a Michael Jordan. Because yeah. like, we have an uncle who is, he went to college, and now he's, he was in law school at the time. Okay. He's going to be a lawyer. And you see on TV, you know, Perry Mason. I know I'm really right. dating myself yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I used to watch Perry Mason, and yeah. I'm like, my uncle's going to be like that. Yeah. And he would send letters, you know what? Just keep your books. Do what your mom asked you to do. You got to watch out for your family. You, And those things would just cause me to think there's something. He knows something I don't know, and so I need to listen to him. Yeah. Uh, and, and then people came around. People from my church would spend time with me. I didn't have I didn't have a father in my life, so it was people coming in to spend time with me and take me on trips, showing me uh, different things that they did, uh, and it lets you see outside of where you are. Yeah. And that's a power thing to a powerful thing to be able to just kind of envision yourself doing something different. Yeah. And so a lot of people who are in poverty, people look at them and say, "Oh, they're just lazy," or well, they just and some people are lazy. I have a big family, a lot of cousins. Some of them are lazy, mm. but some of the people I grew up with. We're motivated. It takes you have to motivation uh, is required to be a criminal. Mm. You have to figure out a way to make money that's illegal, but that you can do it and not get caught. I mean, those they're they're motivated people. Yeah. And and spending time around them, you learn the wrong motivations. But people who look at people in poverty and just think it's their fault, it's it's kind of short sighted yeah. on the fact that if they don't have the exposure and the opportunity. Yeah then you take away two of the most powerful things that that's the, the ingredients of the American dream. So I'm a political outsider. That doesn't mean I, I'm not engaged and, and learned about the political process. For me, the process, I have, I've had mentors currently and previous. C.T. Martin was one of my mentors. Mm. Uh, so I've, I've been learning. I, yeah. So when I say I'm a political outsider, I mean I'm someone looking from outside. I don't ascribe to this has to be the way we do it. Right. Or this party has the, the way we do it. Because all that gets is infighting. Yeah. And people build a, a wall up before you say anything yeah. because you're representing that party or you represent and that's not right. that's not solution driven. Right. That's not gonna get us where we need yeah. to solve inequity. Yeah. So uh, there's and and I wanna look I wanna look and and represent every single aspect of Atlanta. Every yeah citizen, every community. I announced last night that my campaign is not accepting campaign contributions over $99 okay. across the board. Got it. So I'm not, when I'm making decisions, I'm not thinking about the people who wrote big checks to put me in office. Right. I'm thinking about what is best for Atlanta, what is best to move us forward and bring everybody who's willing and wants an opportunity, the opportunity to move forward. So Back to Blue mm -hmm. is a plan that supports the police. So a lot of people are talking about let's recruit 500, whatever your number is, more police officers. My corporate experience tells me that you can recruit people, but if you don't retain, and that's been our problem, is retaining officers. So Why do you think that is? Well, one is the, 
lack of empowerment and support that they're getting. What do they not get support on? So I think they need support when it comes to giving them training on how to deal with situations they face in the communities, exposure to the communities before they're placed there. What my, does that have my, to do with empowerment for them? I mean, I think so that's let me, more a protection for the community, right? Yeah, but let me, okay, let me, let me explain it. <clears throat> Under my plan, <clears throat> when someone's a cadet, when they go into the, the police academy, mm -hmm. they'll be assigned to do volunteer work in local schools. Okay. As a part of their training, because you're serving two purposes. They're getting exposed to helping the career and you're providing mentorship okay. for students who desperately need it. Okay. Once they graduate, they're still going to serve in the schools. Okay. Volunteer. You, it's amazing what one hour a week does. For me, I'm a member of 100 Black Men of America. Mm -hmm. One hour a week, you can transform people's outlook. The exposure we talked about earlier, one hour a week. Mm -hmm. So by having police officers in the community, we remove this stigma of I'm here to fix something people are a place is broken. Okay. When they show up in that community, they're showing up to a place where they've put sweat equity in. That's empowering for them mm. because they're not, uh, they, they can truly serve and protect. So we remove a lot of the, uh, <clears throat> the excessive force uh, situations that, that show up. We take that off. That officer's empowered because he's a part of that community. So it's preventative care for, for policing that if you what you're saying is if we expose uh, officers to young children or to kids um, in neighborhoods, I'm particularly thinking you're talking about black at, neighborhoods. At-risk neighborhoods. Okay, so what's an at-risk neighborhood? Where you have poverty. Okay. So they're black and brown kids. They're where, wherever they're, whatever the, the, in, the, the indicators of poverty which lead to crime. Because which in Atlanta is a direct corollary with on race and yes, age and, it, and all of that. So it it's does. not we don't have to mask it. It's not like they're going into Buckhead to have exposure to the kids, right? Right. So it, well, so we're we're talking about putting cops in schools, um, in neighborhoods that already have a distrust. But that's how right? we build the trust. So how do you build trust with? How do you build trust it by? Putting something that someone is fearful of right into their neighborhood. Yes. Um, and putting it, like, that is how you build trust there. Why do you think we have to do that in black neighborhoods, but we don't have to do that? On we, the you can do it everywhere. Because so you, this is a you, citywide yes, initiative for yes, you? Yes, it's everywhere. Okay, got it. But I'm not showing up as a police officer with a badge and a gun. I'm got showing it. up as, this is Mr. Hill. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here to help. Because mental health is, is an issue. Yeah. And we send officers out there to deal with things that are mental health Absolutely. issues. Absolutely. And I've talked to officers and I've talked to captains and majors and they say, you know what? We can say let's send a separate group out there, but a lot of times something that looks like it's just a mental health issue, it could turn violent. Sure. If a person has a gun or a knife. Sure. And then, you know, we don't want to be on the news with social worker, you know, stabbed because so having enough officers to where they're not stretched yeah. is is a key thing. Because I've, I've done ride-alongs, yeah. and I've done them in the middle of the night where it's like, man, you got all this area. I mean, it's a I was like, you're covering all this area with just you? Yeah. And, and that level of stress. Should we close the, the detention center in Atlanta? No. Okay, why should we not close the detention center in Atlanta? Well, because we need to be able to keep people who are not good for our city off the streets. No, no question about that. I don't think anybody would argue that sentiment. But why does it have to be at the detention center? Well, right now we don't have enough. The, so we're overcrowded in one, and like seriously overcrowded. The county who has the responsibility of dealing right. with that is overcrowded. Right. That is and I think that's, that's, that's a great way to open up partnerships. Like they have a problem. So instead of letting it sit empty, why don't we work together to help solve Maybe solve we can the be the ones who design... I mean, we, we went through an entire process around this, right? Yes, we did. So maybe we can be the ones who are designing the programming to make sure that folks who are in there for having a, you know, an ounce of something on them, um, that they're not sitting in a facility. That that's well, the yeah, detention yeah. center was also built, uh, you know, for the Olympics in a lot of ways, right? And it was, uh, it 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 has, it is a relic in so many ways for so many people of mm -hmm. how the justice system has failed. Right. Um, and so why, uh, why is that the appropriate 
I really want to understand because I think you're a, you're just a like you have a really reasonable uh, perspective on a lot of these things. But when I sit with folks who are justice advocates, mm -hmm. they are firm like that that detention center, if it remains open as a facility that is I, I get that that Fulton County has a problem. Okay. That is Fulton County's problem to make sure that they, there is a entire elected board. They have a massive budget for the for the county. There is federal funds that come in uh, to make mm -hmm. sure. A city that is barely hanging on to be able to afford its basic public services should now take on the responsibility of, of holding people mm -hmm. into a, a, like holding beds, when instead all the plans, all the safety measures, all the studies have shown what that center would be best used for mm -hmm. is to make sure that folks who come in never ever come back. Mm -hmm. So why would we not just use it for what the intention is, the stated purpose mm -hmm. was? Why are we reversing back on that to use it as a detention center? I, I don't understand. So let, let me clarify. So I think right now it needs to be used. I'm not permanently forever going forward. But that's what they said before. Well, that. That's what and so saying. when are we going to stop? But, but here's the thing. If we don't have the conversation around what is the plan for the city of Atlanta and Fulton County to address how we deal with overcrowding and the justice that needs to happen for people who need help. I mean, I'm, I'm, I run a nonprofit. I'm about getting people out of homelessness and transitioning. No doubt. That's why I'm shocked that you want to keep this place Well, uh, it, but, open. but right now we don't need a place that is sitting vacant and unused to oh, I agree with that. We're in agreement on that. Okay. It should not sit vacant. I'm just saying it should. I, I don't know, but I'm saying that that a number of advocates, criminal justice advocates, mm -hmm. are saying, sure, it shouldn't sit vacant. Of course not. Right. A ton of people need help and support. Right. And, I, and I'm all about the help and the support. But now the need is the overcrowding. We need to address that. So that's I'm a not, real estate problem, right? Yeah, but, th but that's, that's a years-long problem to solve. So it's about people and process. Yeah. Set the vision, you have the people in the process. Yeah. You have your checkpoints, you have your dashboards, you look at what well, you have your ear, your uh, leaders are listeners. Yeah. So the skills that I have learned in corporate and in nonprofit, they transition. Yeah. And so I don't think I'm an expert on everything. And sometimes yeah. that's better yeah. because I'm gonna listen.